This is K-pop, one of the most powerful and influential musical styles today, garnering millions of fans, dominating the entertainment industry, and winning the hearts of many. Once you get into it, it's not hard to see why it has so much impact. It is displayed as a world of desire, excitement, and a place of comfort for many who need it. It's an unimaginable experience that leaves you exhilarated and satisfied, but still wanting more. But not all that glitters is gold. Behind closed doors is a world that is darker than what is visible to the human eye. A world of sadness, manipulation, control, and grave realities that no one wants to think of, let alone experience. And what is that world exactly? That's what we're about to find out. It is no secret that one of the greatest drives in human nature is our sexual desires. It is part of what makes us human. Sex is an important part of our lives and one's sexuality is a necessary part that has to be explored at some point in their lives. So it isn't surprising that it has been incorporated into our music for decades now. Acknowledge it or not, sex is attractive. It sells, and it is the fastest way to get money out of customers' pockets. Long gone are the days where people believed that its existence was purely for procreation. Now it has become the best and the most profitable way to market just about anything. Clothes, shoes, cars, and for day kids now, entertainment. Like any other form of entertainment, K-pop is no stranger to the use of sex in the media. Because of globalization, using sex in the media has spread far from just being something of the West. And with the popularization of the male gaze, which is defined as the act of depicting in visual arts and media from a masculine heterosexual perspective and represents women as sexual objects for the pleasure of heterosexual male viewer, its use in the media and entertainment platforms has become frequent. And if we're going to be honest, pretty normal. While media sex exploitation in K-pop has become a hot button issue recently, especially with the involvement of minors, this is something that has been going on for several years and very little action has been taken to stop it from continuing. In itself, there's nothing wrong with selling sex. As I've mentioned earlier, it is part of our human nature, but there are boundaries that need to be considered when selling sex. Boundaries like, I don't know, age? The use of sex in K-pop media goes way back. Both male and female idols alike have been victims to it for a very long time, and it has even influenced the public in what they expect when it comes to the industry. In a culture where sexual crimes are on the rise, especially where children are involved, it is no surprise the majority of K-pop idols who are usually signed into these contracts below legal age are victims of this behavior. Looking back at the times when K-pop was taking a wave worldwide during the second generation, idols such as Hyuna, Sohee, or should we say Wonder Girls in general, Girls Day, Taimin, Stella, Big Bang, and many more, over sexualization of idols, especially minors, has been used. Idols have been stripping off shirts, bending in strange positions for choreos, wearing uncomfortable clothing, and performing songs with explicit content, all with no respect or consideration to their age or respect for their consent. Starting with the fact that during this era, the era of slave contracts, idols were owned by their companies and any and all decisions made on their behalf was on benefit of the company and their pockets. Feeding into the public's fantasies is the main priority when it comes to making money, and sexual content is the fastest way to get them hooked. So the behavior of exploiting female idols and some male idols began. By the time the third generation rolled around with the popularization of sexual liberation for women, and with women in South Korea speaking up about the enjoyment of their sexuality, male idols became the next target for this kind of behavior, and over-sexualization for male idols especially became a norm. The worst part about this is that it spilled over to the fans themselves. Soon it wasn't just companies doing it, it was the fans who were being accustomed to this behavior, with groups such as BTS, Blackpink, Red Velvet, and TWICE popularizing K-pop in the West, a market that was already used to sexual content in music and television shows. This spread like wildfire. The difference between majority of Western music, especially female rap, is that the women and men in sexualized content were legal adults, grown people, all beyond the age of 18 and majority of them gave their consent. Unlike K-pop idols, they had the creative power to decide what they can rap or sing about and what they want to wear and how much of their bodies they were willing to show. Even though they regret it in the future, they do so knowing that majority of it was their choice. 
having the quote unquote sexy member in a group in K-pop became more and more hyped and it largely fed into the fetishizing of Asian men and women also popularly known as yellow fever. The third generation also brought the rise of the fan fiction era which particularly targeted male idols. Content with stories that were used was not only explicit but largely disrespectful to these idols and it only got worse. Soon fan fictions involving rape, domestic violence, sexual assault became popular selling the idea that an idol could do whatever they want to you and it would be okay because they are the epitome of your fantasy. Let me go off the record to explain that being sexy is not a bad thing. Showing skin is not over-sexualizing as long as you're A, comfortable with it, and B, it is entirely your choice. Being sexy and exuding sex appeal is something that's not wrong. Sex appeal is powerful, impressive, and dare I say beautiful. Over-sexualization, on the other hand, is to excessively make something or someone sexual. It involves objectifying, which is viewing or treating a person as an object, devoid of thought or feeling, and often objectifying is targeted to women and reduces them to objects of sexual pleasure and gratification. Over-sexualization is about feeding a pleasure and a fantasy. Sex appeal or being sexy is about the person themselves exuding confidence and being comfortable in their own body by choice. Sex appeal can be no even when a person is fully clothed. It has nothing to do with the body of that person, but rather it focuses on the person and their personal preferences. Oversexualization is done to you by others, not of your choice. And oversexualization of both male and female idols is wrong, dangerous, and immoral on all levels and can never be justified no matter how one spins it. One of the major questions one may have is why sex is often sold so much in the media in the first place. Why is it so appealing to begin with? Well, according to Tom Richard, a professor and the head of the Department of Advertising and Public Relations in the University of Georgia, he says that advertisers use sex appeal because it can be very effective. Sex sells because it attracts attention. People are hardwired in their DNA to notice sexually relevant information. So ads with sexual content gets noticed. So in other words, sex sells because it is attractive and it brings attention from audiences. Naturally, humans want to attract other humans and the best way to do that is to look desirable. So therefore, or advertisers take advantage of that need and use it to further their products. Most men buy perfumes because they actually think that it would drive women wild. They buy cars that are advertised with women on it because they think it would appeal to them, while most women buy products to beautify themselves because they think it makes men like them more. As sad as that sounds, that is the reality. Research has shown over the years that sexual content always gives a purchasing advantage. In other words, the sexier something is, the more it sells. The same thing happens with K-pop. Watch a group that has always done cute concepts. Their attention rises immediately as soon as they change their concept to a sexier one. Sex appeals to the buyer because humans are attracted to it. And the crazy thing about sex? The more of it you consume, the more of it you want. Another reason is the audience's age. Young people are so interested in sex because they are trying to explore themselves. The sad thing is that the generation of their parents isn't one to talk about them openly when it comes to sex. This makes me so glad I have the mother that I do. Anything and everything that they learn is provided online. This has created a generation that has a high tolerance for sexual content. Therefore, artists put their bodies out there because they know that this type of content will sell. There are artists out there who aren't afraid to put their bodies on display. They are confident in their bodies and they are unapologetic when it comes to that. This is commendable, as people should be allowed to do whatever the fuck they want with their bodies. But this is exactly where the key is do what they want. Sometimes what they want is to not show their bodies excessively. And this should be a personal right. But the industry seems to cross that line all too often. Time again, we have seen that the entertainment industry, especially K-pop, will sell sex to their audience with zero regard to age or consent, which is disgusting. K-pop has exhibited this behavior for decades without any shame at all. As long as something lines their pockets, they will do it. Selling sex, as I've mentioned before, isn't a bad thing. The only problem is when the industry crosses that line. Unfortunately for women, a country like South Korea runs deep in the roots of misogyny. And the crazy thing, they don't even try to hide it. When it comes to oversexualization of idols, especially with minors, women are the main targets as their bodies are objectified as nothing more than pleasure for heterosexual men. Young girls in K-pop have to face this constantly. They give their talent to an industry that is not interested in that talent, but rather in what their bodies can give them. 
Looking back at Portuguese 101, where the head PD, Hang Dong Chul, God, I'm disgusted to even say his name, referred to the show as, quote, wholesome pornography. And he went on to make it clear that he created this show as, quote, healthy pornography for the guys. And that the second season, which would be comprised of male competitors, would be, quote, healthy pornography for the ladies. The fact that majority of produce viewers at that time were male and almost or over the age of 40 was all kinds of disturbing. Moreover, the editing in itself of the entire show was all kinds of sexualized and sexist content. Produce 101 was breeding ground for exploitation of minors in the most subtle ways in order for it to not look controversial. From putting minors in school uniforms with such miniskirts, which is a well-known fetish of many predators, dancing to provocative lyrics in western music, and dancing to ex explicit choreographies was just over the top for minors. The second season was chock full of shirt lifting, hip thrusting minors who were only getting attention because they were being sexy and their talent, which is what they were placed on the show for, going completely ignored. And having grown women in the audience screaming and fangirling over these literal children who were being forced to exhibit sexual behavior was all kinds of disgusting. Produce 48 and Produce X, which created Eyes 1 and X1, were highly problematic. I mean, having one young at the age of 15 dancing to side by side a song with very very sexualized lyrics and references sang by two women who were both very well over the age of 18 on national television in front of a bunch of grown ass men was way beyond disrespectful and i swear to god if you bring up what 15 year olds are doing on tiktok to justify this shit i cannot promise that i'll be civil in my response when it comes to women and girls, the inappropriate use of their bodies in the media has been going on for a lot longer than men. Female idols have been placed in uncomfortable situations and have been expected to start acting more provocative once they turn the age of 18, which is also another problem we have in K-pop. The fact that male fans are waiting for girls to turn the age of 18 in order for them to start making sexual references about them is downright disgusting. Girls in the industry are being watched like hawks and all kinds of inappropriate thoughts are being made about them. Then they're becoming publicized once these girls become of age. It goes without saying that even though humanity shouldn't judge a book by its cover, reality is people view you a certain way by the type of dresses you wear. Women of color wearing hoop earrings and dressing in clothing that show cleavage or even having outfits with neon aesthetic are viewed in a particular manner by society. For instance, clothes that show the belly in India are cultural. No one sees you as a prostitute for doing that. But in African culture, a majority of women who dress like that are seen as indecent. Never mind the fact that our ancestors used to walk around without top clothing, but I digress. Girls in K-pop are dressed in the most provocative clothing and it makes them uncomfortable. Idols that are considered the quote sexy member of the group, mainly Joy of Red Velvet, are constantly put in outfits that they have to pull down every five seconds. These women are performing, their stylists know that, yet they proceed to put them in outfits that are clearly uncomfortable and then they try to act like they care by putting safety shorts underneath. Even worse for minors, their place in really revealing outfits. Whether you view it differently or not, the reality is that idols are being objectified by the public and putting underage idols, especially on public television while wearing skin revealing outfits is essentially giving them out to the wolves. Taking the example of Stella, there are groups that only become more popular when and if they take a more mature route. I previously mentioned in one of my unpopular opinions video that girls from smaller companies only are taken seriously if they debut with or change to girl crush concepts. This has been a harsh reality for many but girl crush concepts and provocative concepts are not the same thing. The members of Stella revealed that while yes, going the mature route was what brought them attention in the industry, it was hardly their choice. The company had housed them for three years without seeing any results and they were so financially challenged that them going to a cafe was a luxury. Gayang, a former member, revealed that wearing provocative clothing for their new sexy route was something that the group was forced to do in order to change their financial situation. Doing sexy concepts was the best way to grab attention and to do it fast so it actually worked. By 2014, the sexy concept was the way to go and it became the new norm for them. All their video clips, music, and styling was sexualized to the point that it made them uncomfortable, but the company was so focused on what would make them money. The agents went as far as to even violate their trust. She revealed in an interview towards the end of 2018 that the concept photo for the Viberto comeback was something they spoke up against, but they were forced to take pictures in those outfits anyways. 
They spoke up again that these outfits were too provocative and their agent promised that they wouldn't release the pictures, but they released the photos for the album against their consent. After the girls voiced their disagreement regarding this action, which they had every right to, the company threatened them by throwing their contracts in their faces and in fear that they had to pay the violation fee, they muted themselves just like that. So on top of being uncomfortable, the girls had to deal with their consent being violated. Even worse, for a music video, a member was directed in a scene that she was supposed to take a bottle of milk from the refrigerator and drink it, but quote, weakly leak the milk in the process, which she did. However, the filming and the editing crew, without her knowledge or consent, filmed and edited it in the most sexually provocative way that after the music video came out, the member was so traumatized that she had failed to drink white milk ever since. The worst part about these concepts is that idols who don't make the decisions, who don't get to choose, and who are being objectified are the ones who suffer the consequences while their agencies are never on the receiving end of the damage. Gaiyang has also revealed that people have sent her pictures of their private parts on social media and that she has trauma of wearing revealing clothing. To make matters worse, she constantly receives offers from quote sponsors for her quote services. This company gets no flack. They take zero accountability, but she faces the consequences and the trauma all on her own. And so do the rest of the members. Sexy concepts do more harm than good when they're against the consent of the artist. And if their basis is to make money for the company, sometimes their entire image is seen differently by people and people decide a person's character based on these concepts. Choreography does not need to be sexualized for it to be good. If idols are comfortable with doing sexy things on stage, again, it's totally fine. But being mature doesn't always have to be sexy. Taking the case of Wan Young on Produce 48, covering Side to Side, Yeti of Girls Day in Expectation, Susie of Miss A in Good Girl Bad Girl at fucking 15 years old, literally straight out of middle school, and don't even get me started on Siri's elevator ad. The fact that they had a 16 year old dancing these kind of moves in an elevator and then have a man who's clearly older than her sexualize her was crossing the line. We all know 16 year olds are doing far worse to this day and age. I mean, if you have TikTok, you know. But the fact that she was put on national television with the intention of sexualizing her for grown men to see and enjoy was beyond disgusting. They could have gotten adult members who were comfortable with this concept, but no, JYPE had to pick a minor. This is what leads most male K-pop fans to believe that they can over-sexualize idols and fantasize them in the most disgusting way possible. Like female idols, male idols are no exception to being over-sexualized. The only problem is that for some reason, their over-sexualization is not taken as seriously as that of women. In fact, it's normalized and it's appreciated, which is all kinds of disturbing. While male idols are constantly the victim of the same problems of female idols, like clothing and choreographies and music concepts, but they have a bigger issue. The bigger issue is dealing with the problem of their own fans. For those of you who don't know what a fanfic or rather fanfiction is, it is fiction written by a fan featuring characters from a particular TV series, a film, or real life celebrities. Generally, there's nothing wrong with fanfiction, but when and if male idols are so sexualized to the point where people believe it is okay to write content in which these idols are sexually assaulting people, being involved in gang violence and rape and domestic violence is actually unacceptable. The main message being sent here is that crime and especially sex crimes are okay and justified only if the person administering them is considered quote, hot and sexy. Not only does this cause issues for young readers on the internet, it is a very disgusting light to put these idols in. Yes, this stories are not real, but the characters are based on real living people with morals and lives and writing stories about them in this manner manipulates people's perception of them. They will believe that it is okay to sexualize them no matter what. If there's something that I can't stand, is people in these V lives calling idols terms like daddy and saying inappropriate things to target them. In the case of Han of Stray Kids, he was literally harassed by a fan on a call where she kept talking about how sexy he was. <laughs> You're welcome. I thought um, your voice was really sexy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is my first time that my voice is sexy. Really? <laughs> It is. Yeah. You should be told that all the time. Thank you so much. You're wow, this is so like wow, shy. Oh, <laughs> we're just getting warm. Oh, <laughs> baby. 
Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah, you are a baby. Han clearly looked uncomfortable in that call, but tried his best not to show it. While people were upset, we all know that if it was a male fan speaking to a female idol, the noise would have been 10 times louder. This girl literally acted like she was YN in a Wattpad story. Han was literally being objectified on a live platform with loads of people watching, and this girl thought that what she was doing was okay. This goes on to show that not only is fans' loyalty questionable, but companies alone aren't to blame for the over-sexualization of idols. Fans play a massive role in the insinuating and tolerating that kind of behavior. Companies only focus on what benefits them and their pockets. We are responsible for putting that money in their pockets when we get what we want. Fans constantly love to place all the blame on the companies. And while yes, these companies are responsible for their behavior, and quite frankly, like I've said before, they're trash, especially when they put minors in uncomfortable positions and release content without their consent. We as fans prove that we enjoy that content by funding it and giving it attention through buying all these albums in excessive amounts and writing these preposterous fanfics. The companies have marketing departments responsible for observing what the market wants and selling it to them. And the idea that we entertain over-sexualization of K-pop idols at all levels is what they are reading and it is what they are going to sell to us. Once again, there's nothing wrong with a girl liking something sexy that an idol has done. But when they're obsessed with making and reading over sexualized fanfics and expecting something sexy or publicly calling them sexy terms on social media platforms in ways that make them uncomfortable, we encourage this behavior. Sometimes the members in the groups don't have a problem with being sexy. Take Monster X for example. Being sexy for Shonu and Wano when he was both in and out of the group came natural to them. But they got objectified for this behavior as being nothing more than eye candy and they are called daddy on social media platforms literally every 5 seconds. That is not exactly the best way to praise their sexiness. Yes, they are both of age, but that's not justification of over sexualizing them either. Which brings our next problem, the coming of age. Not every idol is comfortable with being sexy or presenting themselves that way. One of the creepy things I've noticed about K-pop is this idea that K-pop fans, especially male Korean fans, cannot wait for idols to reach a certain age in order to start commenting sexual things about them. It's nauseating. There is nothing honorable about looking at an idol in a sexual manner and then claiming on social platforms that you can't wait for them to become of age so you can express your sexual fantasies. In fact, it is sick-minded to know that that's how your brain operates. The matter of age is not a passport for fans to over-sexualize them. I have also heard people defending their over-sexualized fanfics, claiming that these idols are quote, writing about adults, but the question still remains. What makes you think they are okay with it? An idol being of legal age says nothing about themselves or how they personally feel about being objectified in that manner. I'm not saying that you're a horrible person if you've read these kinds of fanfics. Believe me, I've been there. I'm not pretending to be holier than thou, but the reality is that it is not okay and we should not justify it because of their age. Either way, fans are only half of the problem, because even if K-pop fans stopped supporting over sexual content, it doesn't mean that behind the scenes nothing is happening. One of the hard things to imagine in K-pop is the idea that sponsor culture may be happening. For those who don't know what sponsor culture is, it is simply the exchange of fame in the industry from powerful people for sex. The sponsor is usually the powerful person in the music industry, either a producer or record label owner who will either favor a particular idol or a group when and if these idols give them something sexual in return. Even worse, the sponsor could be someone who isn't directly involved in the music industry but has powerful business products that can sponsor music videos or feature a group in order to make them more popular in advertisements. Sometimes a sponsor could be just a random person with a lot of money who will offer fame or money to the K-pop idol wannabe. While we have no concrete examples of which idols do this or have been involved or forced into this kind of culture, there's no denying that this kind of behavior is a possibility. Some former idols have actually talked about it, and as I mentioned before, Stella's former member has talked about getting these kinds of offers due to their concept change. Now, Dalshabad Seti has talked about this on her YouTube channel. She revealed that this culture is very much existent, and honestly, considering everything that we've heard about the industry, it can't be too surprising. One of the major reasons why most agencies are against idols having personal social media accounts is to protect them from these kinds of situations. Young people are compulsive and sometimes they take up offers that they don't fully understand. 
Sometimes, however, it could be something that is completely against their will. SETI also revealed that some agencies are not totally against sponsor culture and they're willing to give up particular idols in order to get sponsorships. She said, quote, to be honest, it's a matter of the agency that you're assigned to. There are agencies which accept the sponsorship offers and the CEO passes on the suggestion to the agency's artists. Even worse, when and if idols turn down these sponsorships, they can actually get disadvantages from it. Anything from getting fired from a role, losing screen time or even getting excluded from debuts is a possibility. Of course, while idols can still succeed without their sponsorships, the idea of someone powerful bending your entire career at their will is scary. They could cut screen time, they could cut screen or line distribution, or even make up rumors about you and damage your reputation. This is a problem that apparently has been running long in the world of K-pop, but it hasn't been spoken of highly because of the consequences that come with it. The idea of being blackballed in the industry and risking everything you have worked so hard for in some cases since you were a child is unfathomable. A popular Korean YouTuber exposed a DM in which he called out a woman who offered him 17,000 US dollars in exchange for a date night and sexual favors. This brought the reality that these things are happening right now. Plenty of idols may have had to deal with this at some point in their careers. Other idols may be actively involved while others are probably forced into doing this and comply out of fear of losing their careers. K-pop is so much bigger than just music. It is an industry where those who have the money have the power and those who need it are at their mercy. There's plenty that is happening that the powers that be will go to great lengths to hide from the public. What we see in K-pop is just the tip of the iceberg. The industry is not the rainbows and unicorns that they feed us on a daily basis, and media's exploitation is living proof of that. Idols are not living the fantasy that we imagine. Some are treated awfully, some are involved in situations they wish they weren't, and others could be far worse. Sex is used to attract viewers all over the world and while sex is attractive, it comes at a price. Disregard of age, the disrespect of consent, and the stripping away of the dignity of these idols. They are used by companies to do what benefits them the most with no respect to their boundaries whatsoever. What is covered in today's video is what fans can read in between the lines, but what actually happens behind closed doors could be worse, more frightening, or possibly unimaginable. There is more that lies beneath the iceberg that only the powerful and those who hold the reins of the politics of K-pop are aware and in full control of. The best we have is our imagination, but our limited experiences could never possibly picture what to others may be a reality. K-pop has proven to be an industry that disrespects idols sexually for its own benefit. It forces minors to behave in sexually enticing ways because the audience doesn't care about their talent, just what they can do for their fantasies. It forces idols to dress in uncomfortable ways just so they can appear sexy and worst of all it ignores consent of these idols and threatens to financially break them when and if they choose to speak up sexual exploitation is real in k-pop and it is happening on a daily basis and we as fans of these idols have to do our part by spreading awareness speaking up when necessary and limiting our appetite for sexual content for these idols and start looking at them like they are human beings not objects that can fulfill our desires you have a responsibility and a part to play and you owe it to them to live up to it until the next time Stay safe, God bless, and I love you.